All right. Well, hello and welcome back. Let's talk about who goes first and when in Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition Combat. That's right. We're talking about initiative. Now, if you've played other editions of D&D, you probably have an idea on how initiative works, at least in your version. But it is quite different, especially if you're coming from a newer version um, in 1st Edition compared to the later ones. So but my group has already adopted a suggestion from the Dungeon Master's Guide, page 62, which they feel helps speed up things. I'm still kind of on the fence, but I don't hate it. Uh, by the book, a d6 is rolled for each opposing force, the entire adventuring party, and all of the monsters, and the results are compared. So two total dice are rolled. Um, the entry in the DMG states that rolling one dice for the entire side is not accurate, and that separate rolls can be made for each member of a smaller group. It also mentions that larger groups will find this unwieldy which I think is going to be true, but we haven't gotten there yet. How we were doing this is a spin of the uh, kind of on that paragraph on that initiative and Dungeon Master's Guide. This isn't without other problems, though, which I'll kind of touch on later. That said, all of my players are doing their own initiative, as suggested in that paragraph. So everybody rolls their own D6, and I put them into turn order. To be fair, we have tried it by the book, as I mentioned earlier, but they kind of prefer to do it this way for now. They also apply their dexterity adjustments as normal, so archers, slingshot wielders, and dagger throwers apply it when not encumbered. Of course, this is done at the beginning of every round of combat. And like I said, we might change this at some point, but right now we're trying it out here, and now we're a small party without henchmen, so it is working okay. Now, one huge advantage of doing it this way is that the players stay engaged. How later versions do initiative? A player knows that for the entire combat, they go after the same person every time. So, once they complete their turn, I've seen players pick up phones, run for snacks, head to the bathroom, and so forth. I've even heard of 4th edition players that will start up a game of magic between their turns. The, the reason is, is that they know they have maybe 15, 20 minutes before they get to go again. And so they get bored and they go do something else. And I tell you what, if a player gets bored at the table, they're going to go do something else and never come back. But when the initiative is fluid and constantly changing, I've noticed that everybody participates and combat actually goes faster. It just kind of flows. And that's the opposite of what I predicted, by the way. I kind of figured it would be all kinds of clunky and a lot of confusion. But enough of the rant. Back to the topic. Um, initiative takes place after surprise and after the DM determines the distance between the combatants. Oh, and by the way, if one side was surprised, then you don't have to roll initiative. Instead... You just have the surprise party go last. Of course, this doesn't work as well when everybody rolls their own as how we're doing it, which is you know, one of my issues that I have with it. But the engagement is really outweighing that so far. But like I was saying, if you don't already know the party's distance from each other, you go ahead and determine that real quick. I oftentimes have a map on the table already, so I and my players both kind of already know what the distance is going to be, or it's pretty easy to figure out. And I know you're going to say that I'm being too nice, but hey, I did have a player unintentionally kill his character the other day when trying to solo a um, coffer corpse. So uh, oh, I'll just tell that story in a different video. Um, if, if you're interested, I'll put a link. One really cool rule is that characters who are not surprised, but they're on the ball, they might get a benefit before initiative and get to act before the dice are rolled. This is not part of surprise. This is a reward for being ready. For example, the archer is about to fire, got the arrow was knocked, just waiting for the goblin to round the corner. 
goblins round the corner, then yes, he gets to shoot right away as soon as he sees it. You don't say, you see them, you roll initiative, they continue their charge, you finally fire. No, you just fire. You know, that goblin was chasing the party. They knew it was coming. The goblin knew it was chasing the party. Neither side was surprised, but the PC was ready and gets a boon, okay? Other examples will come up in play, and it's up to the, to the DM to decide if they go off um, before initiative. Uh, traps, attacking from shadows, perhaps. This is a free shot, by the way. And yes, by the book, they get to go again during regular initiative. They're not being punished. They're not taking their turn early. They actually get to go twice. And of course, bow springs can't be pulled taunt for a long time, and nobody walks to the dungeon spinning their sling, just waiting to shoot it. And of course, everybody's always ready. But this part of the rule should come up naturally in play and not used to munch in the dungeon. It is up to the DM if the rule triggers or not, not the player. The player can try to set it up, but it's still up to the DM. All right, as you can see here, I have a battle map here of a combat about to start. In this case, the party is facing that coffer corpse from against the cult of the reptile god, which is where my player lost his character there. Um, it's also in the Fiend Folio on page 19 if you don't have that uh, adventure. Now, as the DM, I know that the coffer corpse is going to concentrate on the fighters who barged into the room. It might also change targets if a better one appears, but coffer corpses aren't very smart, so I will not use any intentional tactics. I might even throw the players a bone when the cleric fails to turn the zombie. I would say that he felt it was a much more powerful creature than he thought, and his god is indicating to him that it might take some kind of magic to defeat. After all, it does turn as a wraith and can only be hurt by magic weapons. Kind of depends upon the cleric and the players, of course, how much information you'd give them. So the players declare their actions before every round. And the thing here is if a player takes too long per page 71 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, they might get to go later or not at all as they are standing by dithering. Great word, dithering. <laughs> At any rate, spellcasters state exactly which spell they will cast. Other characters can be more generic, such as I shoot my bow or I charge forward with my sword. Uh, by the book, each side rolls 1d6, and the scores for the two parties are compared. I've read about some variations from other sources. For example, in one variation, a PC rolls for the monsters, and the DM rolls for the entire PC party. In the DMG, the only other option I've found is the uh, separate roles, like I've discussed earlier, and kind of how we're playing. And that's the only optional rule for initiative that I've come across so far that's by the book. Lots of other people are doing it different ways, though. And of course, players apply any bonuses that they may have, which could change the segment that they end up in. So well, once initiative gets all sorted out, the combat round happens. I do have different videos where I dig into the combat round and segments and all that. Um, but to suffice it to say that everybody takes their attack. Um, but to suffice, suffice it to say that everybody takes their attack routines, combat actions, caster spells, drinks or potions, etc. in order. And I will have a link to my combat playlist in the description if you want to check that out, because I do go into a lot more detail in some of those other videos. Now, this next part could be a little bit confusing, especially if you've only played things like 5e. If your characters have reached the level where they get multiple attack routines, then these are actually spread out over the initiative order and they don't take them all at once in their segment. So if they have the advantage, then they go first and last. If the monsters have multiple attack um, as well, there's a couple of things to consider. So if, they are if the monster is attacking with the same weapon, then they get split into different segments, um, just like the characters do. 
One side goes first and third, and the other second and last, depending upon who won the initiative. One important note here, if the monster just attacks with different weapons, claw and bite, for example, then those monster attacks happen at the same time in the same segment because it's part of their normal attack routine and not considered to be extra attacks. It's not like multiple attacks, it's just part of their same attack routine. A bear, for example, does claw claw bite. This is one attack routine, it's in one segment. It just has multiple attack uh, roles, but they're all in the same segment. So these attacks are not spread across multiple segments. It would only happen if they had two separate attacks. Now I mentioned weapon speed factor earlier. This is only really used during ties to determine who strikes first. The lower weapon speed goes first in that case. When the combat round is complete, we rinse and repeat, starting all over with the rolling of the D6 per player, or if you're just doing by sides, just roll the two sides, see who has initiative and go with it. We've experimented with keeping the same initiative throughout the combat like you do in later versions, but the players really enjoy mixing it up and having their characters go in different orders, which is kind of cool, really. Because as I've said, it certainly keeps everybody much more engaged than having that static initiative order. Spellcasting and initiative actually could be its own video. Uh, but these are a few things that have came up a few times in my games. So I'm just going just to do a real quick summary here. Uh, Spellcasting can be disrupted by an attack, yes. Even if the spell is complete, especially if the attacker is using a melee weapon and makes a successful attack before the spell goes off. Okay, as an example, let's say that the good magic user and the evil fighter, see how I switched the roles there, are facing off and have tied their initiative. So they're in the same segment. The evil fighter makes a melee sword attack. The magic user is going to cast magic missile because it's fast and does some damage. Every spell has at least one segment of casting time. If the fighter hits the magic user and does one point of damage, the spell is lost. Because melee goes off first. But if it hasn't went off yet, and every spell has at least one segment, remember, before it goes off, yes, even magic missile, a successful attack disrupts the spell. Now, there are no saves for the magic user. If they lose a hit point, they lose the spell. End of story. So, fighters, protect your spellcasters. Spellcasters, hide behind something, okay? So you're not a target for the archers. All right, especially before casting spells with long ca casting times. Uh, the player's handbook actually suggests on page 65 the spellcasters shouldn't cast their spells in combat at all. I don't see that as being realistic, but it does suggest that. Well, that's about it for Initiative and 1E. Uh, check out my combat playlist to see all of my 1E combat videos. Hey, thanks for watching the video. Please give a like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon. Catch you next time. Bye.